I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 84 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 084. Normally, I'd throw something in that's a kind of a recurring micro segment here, but this time, well, I saw a firearm this week that it kind of made me sad. I had a local gentleman bring me a firearm and tell me that basically he had planned to have the pistol color case finished. I looked at him. I said, you mean you plan to have a color case finish applied to the weapon? He goes, well, yeah, that's what I mean. And, you know... What he got was something that if you held it just right, in just the right light, sprayed bleach in your eyes, and squint while looking at it, it might pass for being a color case finish. The problem is his source for the job, they they had a good reputation for doing camo finishes, and this is a guy that he went and saw in Colorado, but they have a, they have a good reputation for camo finishes with this business, and they use a popular product for refinishing a firearm. It comes in a it comes in a can and it's applied like a paint i'm not going to name the product because i'm not 100 percent sure which brand they went with but it's basically a type of firearm paint now the company that or not the company but the gentleman he had do this has he doesn't do anything other than paint guns as far as finishes work goes and my and this local gentleman he stuck with this gun in this finish he's got another guy that's local that does the same type of thing but he's actually going to redo the gun and I think I think the current plan is to go with John Deere colors, green and yellow. Well, that's what he was saying. He might have been sarcastic on that because out here in West Texas, if it's yellow and green, that almost immediately uh, drives the price up by a factor of 10. I don't mean it adds 10 to it. I mean it multiplies it by 10. Sadly, there is nothing else like a true color case finish. And when you look at a farm that has such a finish, it actually stands apart. Each and every one of these firearms, you can have three identical frames go in and get a color case finish, and they all come out different. Now, I do have a friend that does this type of work, and I mentioned him to this gentleman, and maybe he'll take it to my friend, but I don't know for a fact. In fact, I may I may get a hold of my friend and see if he's interested in coming on the podcast to discuss his work. Hmm, I ought to do that. Anyhow, let me let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. After that, we'll come back and we'll touch on some listener feedback before we move on. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. I'll tell you what, I'm I'm actually enjoying using this application I've installed on the iPad. It It's every bit what I use, or the application that I use on the Nexus 7, but it's got other capabilities. And I plan to use those capabilities in the future. It's just a matter of getting around. Sorry about that, I bumped the microphone. But it's just a matter of getting around and trying it. However, I, I'm going to see what I can do. But moving on to listener feedback, we have an email from Jeff who wants to know what odds constitutional carry has in the next legislative session. Well, every day that, it's, that all the different organizations that really pushed it in the past are quiet and they're not in the news, the odds go up. I really don't think it's got good odds of being passed in the next legislative session because of all the negative feelings from the previous one, I could be wrong, but I don't think it does. I will say that I strongly, and I do mean strongly, suspect there is a good chance that we'll see legislation introduced. It will be, it'll actually be looked at a little more closely this time if everybody behaves themselves. And yes, Jonathan Stickland, I am thinking of you when I say that, but I don't think it's got good odds this legislative session. It'll take a lot of hard work. It'll take a lot of it'll take a lot of politicking to get it done. And I really don't think anybody that has the capability of doing that politicking has an interest in it. Not right now. Right now, I think everybody rightfully thinks we need to move on other things like expanding where people with a license can carry. And don't 
don't think for an instant that I'm saying constitutional carry is dead without the TSRA stepping on it and supporting it, and then suddenly it will pass. That's not the case. I don't think even the TSRA and the NRA working on it in the next session will get it to pass. I think it's a lost cause for the next session. It would take a miracle, and even then it would take the NRA and the TSRA making it a flagship bill to pass it. I think in order to pass open carry without a license would be easier than passing complete carry without a license. And I really think that's kind of what Oklahoma is shooting for. I haven't looked to see where their legislation's at, if it's passed, if it's been signed and all that. But just a few miles to the west of me, I happen to have a state that has unrestricted open carry. You don't have to have a license to carry there if you do it openly. I think Texas needs to look at the states around us and say, yeah, this looks like it's a definite consideration to consider, or it's definitely something we need to consider doing. However, as with all things in politics, it takes a lot of political capital, and it takes people that that should know better to act better. Don't think I'm trying to, don't think I'm trying to, I'm looking for the word here. Don't think I'm trying to throw unlicensed carry under the bus, because I'm not. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure people understand it's not something I'm expecting to see passed without a major fight. It just isn't. Now, with that said, I do think it has a chance in the session after next if everybody behaves themselves from now through that session. Jeff, I hope that I hope that kind of gives you what I think on the issue, but don't think that I'm I don't think I'm trying to put it down or trying to scuttle it or throw it under the bus because I'm not. I'm being a realist here. Moving on, Sally has written in to say she has taken her class, turned in her paperwork, and is now waiting on the post office to deliver her license, which should not take more than a day, but it has taken more than a week. She's wondering what the holdup is, and she points out she lives in Austin. Well, Sally, let me say that my understanding of the way the DPS does this, they get everything ready for mailing, they put it in the envelope, and then it goes into a stack. And then like once a week or so, maybe twice a week, they take all of those stacks and they take them to the mail. And that's really what I think the holdup is. It took a little over a week for me to get mine. And I live here in West Texas once it went to the status being mailed. And that was a while back. The website and what it says now has changed, but or the way it says it has changed, let me put it that way. However, when mine was mailed, it wasn't but a little when it went to mail as status, it took about a week or so. And I've had several people tell me similar things. It goes to the DPS mailing office and they don't mail it till they haven't until they have a certain quantity met or it's a certain day or something like that. And then they go out and they mail everything. Well, I think it's time to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. Then we'll come back and we'll hit our interview or not our interview, but we'll hit our main topic. With that said, here's how to be social with well me. The gun rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, if you noticed a few things changing during that, I was actually messing with the mixer board trying to find a, a very specific setting. I apologize. However... It's time to revisit Fines for Signs, and I want to be honest. People, please show some patience. A lot of people are upset because the Attorney General's office has not actually taken a single governmental entity to court since the Fines for Signs law came into effect on September 1st of 2015. Well, let's go look at what's going on and consider how that influences things, shall we? Now, the law went into effect, and AG, and when I say AG, Please note that I'm saying attorney general. I'm referring to the attorney general. But when the law went into effect, several attorney general's opinions were requested. In fact, two opinions were requested that would have an influence on how the AG would proceed with complaints relating to this law. The first one is KP0047. The Texas attorney general issued an opinion on a request that relates to what portions of a building are off limits due to the language in and this is a part of the language that defines premises. 
It's referred to by 4603, but the language itself is in 46035. And the specifics are building or portions of a building or portion of a building. Well, let's consider this. The Attorney General's opinion essentially says that in a multi-use building, while the courts decide what's essential for their operation, a multi-use building cannot be off limits unless everything in that building is utilized by the courts. Well, some counties have said, well, we got to use the hallways to get to court. So those are utilized by the courts. We got to use the judge and the jury and the plaintiffs and the defendants and even the bailiffs got to use the restroom. So those are off limits. All the offices in the court are subject to court orders. So those are off limits. I don't think that's what the attorney general meant. I don't think that's what the legislature meant. I think it's just somebody grasping straws to say, hey, we want to ban guns and we're going to. The second attorney general's opinion, KP0049, it deals with what language a sign might have that would constitute a violation of the fines for signs law. Now, I'm actually going to open that in a web browser. I hope you don't hear my keyboard. I'll try to edit that out. Essentially, the the request was, does a sign that says weapons-free zone but does not include language from 30.6 violate the restrictions? Does oral notice by security by a security deputy to a license holder that he may not enter the building, housing the courts and offices, but also houses uh, offices not directly used by the courts, violate the restrictions? And is a license holder who wishes to enter the government center in this is, I believe, the Hayes County Government Center, or is a license holder in violation of Texas Penal Code 30.6 if the license holder is told by security personnel that possessing a firearm in the building is prohibited and the license holder refuses to relinquish any carried firearms and also refuses to exit the building? Well, the opinion is basically, uh, let's see, I, it's five pages. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. You can read it yourself. But he addresses all that. And I really, I really think if you're going to be dealing with your, uh, if you're going to deal with a core or someone else that has such a prohibition, then you really need to read this. Now, because of these opinions being requested by the Attorney General's office, or being requested of the Attorney General's office, they had to deal with them and publish them prior to taking any action. Additionally, the AG had to, out of fairness, give the offending governmental bodies an opportunity to take corrective action once his opinions were made public. Considering that these opinions were published towards the end of December, the earliest that he could move forward on the process of dealing with complaints would have been early to mid-January of 2016. And I'm saying closer to mid-January of 2016. Now, When the attorney general's opinions were published and the offenders had time to correct their signs, the AG could finally start acting on the opinions. First, he had to determine the validity of each complaint. And basically, he's sorting them into three piles if he does it like anybody else I know. One pile is, this is probably valid, this might be valid, and this probably isn't valid. And then he takes the stack that is probably valid and looks at them closer. And he decides, yes, we're going to pursue this one. No, we're not going to pursue it. And then he goes into the next stack and he says, okay, does, do these complaints overlap with any of those complaints? If so, he will look at them and say, okay, this adds to it or it doesn't. But he's cherry picking. Why does he cherry pick? Because that's what attorneys do. And you want them to do this. Now that, now that these complaints have been reviewed and the Ability of each one has been determined, he has to investigate each complaint. And when he investigates a complaint, it's not him going and doing it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But basically what he has to do is he has to investigate investigate each complaint and then decide if action is warranted or not. How long does it take to investigate such a complaint? Well, that depends on how thoroughly the documentation presented to the Attorney General's office is, or how thorough it is. It also depends on how complete the documentation is. It depends on if he has somebody that can investigate it already there or not. A lot of factors come into play. It may take 30 days to get a to get something investigated and get it where he's happy with the investigation. Maybe 
the investigation, the investigators sends back a report and he says, okay, I like what you've got here, but I need you to go back and check this and this and this. Well, guess what? He has to go back and investigate all that. It could take, it could take quite a while to investigate something to the level of, well, to the level that the AG feels is necessary to go ahead and pursue this. Things they have to consider are, first off, does the property actually belong to or is leased by a government body? You see, if somebody's donating the use of the building or the facility to the government, it's not leased. So that complicates matters. But if the building is owned or leased by them, that simplifies matters. They have to know this. I guarantee you, if it's something that the government's having the use of the facility donated to, and they don't have the ability to take a sign down, that case is not going to hold up. You know, once the ownership or lease status of the property is determined, the investigator has to determine what all details of the complaint are, or he has to verify the details of the complaint and verify that the complaint is still valid. Notice may have been given to the uh, to the violator, and the violator may have had a couple of meetings, and in the meantime, they have argued it, and they finally pull their sign down. Let's say the investigator shows up, and the sign's uh, up one day. He's getting ready to file his complaint or file his report. He goes back. He's checking everything off, make sure he's got everything right. He looks up, and somebody's pulling the sign down. It would be kind of stupid for the AG's office to send a letter. So in his report, he puts down, hey, um, uh, signs were being taken down as I was finishing my report. Uh, recommend revisiting this in 30 days or so. So now we've gone from, say, mid-January to mid-February to the end of February. Now we're into March. The AG has decided to prosecute a complaint. Now, every complaint that reaches this stage, he has to consider, do I prosecute it now? Do I put it into the save for later file? Or do I not even prosecute it? Now, keep in mind that the attorney general is, by definition, I might add, an attorney. And attorneys are notorious for picking and choosing cases they can easily win before moving on and choosing cases that carry a higher risk of failure. This means that he will prioritize a case. And once he has it prioritized, the lower priority ones will get a notification sent to the offender where they have an opportunity to correct their violation. Once the required time has passed, after the offender has been notified, if they are still in violation, the attorney general can still, or at that time, start legal action. Now, when I say 30 days, that's just, that's just a rough guess. I guarantee you, if I was the attorney general, I would want my investigators going over everything. I would want them looking at things like property ownership, if it's not owned, is it leased? Is it donated use? What is in that building? What functions does the do the facilities in that building hold? What responsibilities does whoever's in charge of that building have? Is the sign actually on a portion that is controlled by the government entity? Let's say the let's say the city of XYZ owns a piece of land. I own the parking lot around their piece of land. And let's say that their building is consumes all their land because I have donated the use of the parking lot. Well, they don't have author the authority to take down my signs that I post at the edge of my parking lot and into the entrances of my parking lot. Just like I don't have the authority to take down the signs that they post in the right of way that they control or on their building. So if let's say my property own or my property manager, because I'm an absentee landlord, I have a property manager to run it. Let's say my uh, property manager says, I don't want people storing guns in their vehicles on this property because that causes a burglary risk. If there's a burglary, ri ah, I get my tongue tied. If there's a burglary risk, my insurance rates might go up and I'm going to post 30 out six signs and no gun signs and prohibit firearms in the parking lot. Never mind this guy's not an attorney. He doesn't know the uh he doesn't know the nuances of the parking lot law. He just decides I want to do this to keep my insurance rates down. So the property manager posts 30 out six and 30 out seven signs. He also posts a big old huge gun busters. And he posts a sign saying no long guns allowed either. Now the government facility, 
that is surrounded by my property with these signs has no control and no authority to take my signs down. Now, John Q. Public may not realize that the government does not own that property. So John Q. Public contacts the building owner and then the county or the district. Nah, you see, I'm getting my attorneys confused here. I was going to say county attorney, then I was going to say district attorney. The whole time I meant the attorney general. But he contacts the attorney general and files a complaint. Well, his documentation shows, hey, there may be something here. So the AG's office sends an investigator. The investigator looks at it, goes, okay, the government owns this building, and the signs impede somebody making it to the building. But wait a minute, something's not quite right here. The surrounding property belongs to another party, and the signs are on the surrounding properties. Well, in the process, the AG's office may say, well, I'm sending a letter to the complainant, and I'm sending a letter to the government body, and I'm going to tell them. There's nothing I can do. The signs are not on government property. However, I am notifying the property owner that, well, there there are nuances to the law that he's not aware of, and he might want to take his uh, anti-gun signs down, or at least recognize that an easement exists for the government body. And that would be perfectly right. I'm not saying that you cannot prohibit guns in a parking lot, because that's a whole nother episode. In fact, how to start planning out an episode on the parking lot law. Anyhow, that's why it's taken so long. A lot of these, he's just now sending notices that people are in violation. And then he has to give them, I think it's 15 days. After the 15 days are up, then if they have not cured it, he has to send somebody to verify the problem still exists. And then he can file his complaints. Well, not his complaints, but he can file his lawsuit. And once he files the lawsuit, the signs may come down and they may uh, short circuit the lawsuit. Then again, it may not. He may go ahead and push them and say, okay, you had 15 days. It took you 30 to take it down. You're going to pay a fine for each of those 15 days they were still up. Who knows? However, at this point, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. Then we're going to come back and we're going to hit the news. Now, our news girl, since I've got an Apple device in front of me, we're going to call her Siri this week. But our news girl, she's given me a whole list of things. And I think I'm going to narrow it down to about four, maybe five items, which means I'll probably be in trouble with her. However, she works hard, and I'm still trying to get her to let me use her real name on here. I don't know why she doesn't want to. But we're going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me, and then at that point I'll have all the news cut down, and we'll be ready to do that. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now, I'm trying to keep this a short episode, and that's not really working out the way I wanted. There is a whole thing in there that I did. I'm planning to cut out, and that'll probably take about 20 minutes out of the episode. The reason I cut it out is it really doesn't apply to this podcast. I went off on a tangent. I had a little bit of a rant, and I cut it out. Hopefully, I can do this in a less than, how shall we say, a less than messy manner of editing but our first news category is going to be campus carry texas universities are still formulating rules for campus carry which goes into effect for the most part on september 1st of 2016 this article discusses various rules that some universities are planning to implement most notably i believe it's ut the problem with having uh what did i say we're going to call her i think i said we're going to call her siri because i got an apple product here the problem with having siri do the news for me I got a whole bunch more news to go through than if I was doing it myself. Then I cut it back to four or five, sometimes seven or eight. And I have to read all of them that she sends me to make sure that it's what I think it is. To do less would be to, well, to do less would be to be slacking. And I'm not going to do that. Texas Tech, on the other hand, has announced that they have their campus carry policy and they have published it. Now, Their policy will restrict carry in some dorms, but not all. 
And Tech has a number of policies relating to carry that, well, you can find them in a link in the article that I'm going to link to. Moving on, politics is the next category. And this, oh my gosh, this next article is insane. You have two groups trying to outderp each other. The Bureau for American Islamic Relations called BEAR. And no, they're not an actual government bureau. They're just a group of people that says, hey, we're going to call ourselves the Bureau of American Islamic Relations. They, along with the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, held a posing protest while armed in Dallas, Texas. There's a lot of intelligence in this story. And by intelligence, I'm being... I'm not actually meaning actual intelligence. I'm meaning sarcastic intelligence. Tensions got pretty high during the protest, and police eventually ordered Bear to leave the area. I believe the word evacuate was used because, well, things look like it, people might start shooting. <laughs> I want to link to the Breitbart version of this story, and they have a video. I've watched their video. It's painful to watch. There's a language warning that goes with the video. So if you're somewhere where language is a problem, like work or with little children around, don't watch the video. Our next story in the politics category, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has decided that the Dallas Zoo meets the technical requirements to be considered an amusement park. Now Texans are considering other avenues to deal with the posting of signage that prohibits licensed carrying of arms while at the zoo. The thing about this is, how's the best way to go about it? The zoos in Texas have been a sticking point for Texans with concealed handgun licenses since 30-06 signs became the law of the land. Now, now it's people with a license to carry that have this problem because there's no more CHLs. It's now licenses to carry. All I can say is we will find a way to resolve this. If it means going back to the legislature and removing off-limits locations, hey, it'll happen. We're not above going back to the well. And we'll keep going back to the well until we have everything we want. In our final article, also tied into email, the Texas DPS has seen a massive 139% increase in licensed applications. Or license applications, sorry about that. Now this explains the delay in processing that many people are reporting. And some parties claim that open carry is the reason for the sudden increase in applications. Now I personally find this to be unlikely because... This trend is not limited to Texas. States all across the Union are reporting, wait for it, an increase in applications. And last I knew, Texas was the only state to pass licensed open carry recently. Hmm. Now, if you have a three-letter group that's going around bragging, we caused an increase in licensed to carry applications by passing open carry, I got news for you. You didn't. You didn't because you didn't pass this bill. You fought it tooth and nail until it became obvious that your bill was dead on arrival. And then you continued to fight it until it became obvious that there was no resuscitation for your bill and that, well, uh, the various houses had already taken your bill out behind the woodshed and put it down. And then you finally got on board and supported this bill begrudgingly after you tried to kill it. On top of that, if that's the case, then why are all these other states seeing this sudden increase in applications for license to carry? I'll tell you why. There are other factors at play, not just open carry. And with that said, I'd like to thank the audience for listening. I would like to thank our news girl, Siri. I, I believe that's what I called her this week. And I would like to thank everybody that has participated in advancing our gun rights. If that means I've thanked you twice or more than twice, more power to you. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.